Well, hello, folks. Welcome to Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I'm Eric. I'm your president, and it's a pleasure to be of service to you. Uh, I want to remind you all that next week we have a board meeting, and coming up shortly we're going to be announcing uh, something you could be a part of, which is our slate of officers for the 2014-2015 season. If you'd like to serve the forum in any capacity as a volunteer, board member, or otherwise, please see me or another board member, and we'd be happy to uh, fill in the gaps. I'd like to now cover what we're going to do today, and. Uh, we are awaiting an appearance from uh, Joe Ray Perkins. So we do not know if she's going to be here today. And the rumor mill suggests it's likely that she's not. So we may just do a f uh, metro only program. Format will be uh, Tom Hughes first for eight minutes, Jeremiah Johnson for uh, an additional eight minutes. And then we're going to do Q&A with a one minute closing. Hey, John McWilliams, are we doing the, uh, 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 the one minute closing rebuttal before or after Q&A? Uh, after the Q&A. After Q&A. Okay, and so Jeremiah Johnson is up first. My apologies. Uh, so what I'd like to do is ask you to give Jeremiah Johnson a warm round of applause for his first eight minutes. Hello, everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, first off, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, these public forums that you guys put on are, are the important part. This is where you really get to meet people and talk directly face to face with people about the real issues and hear the real questions. So um, thank you very much for allowing me to be here today and speak to you. Um, real quick, what I went into this race for is in 2010, um, there were a lot of issues that <coughs> fell either under Metro or were influenced directly by Metro that I thought were not being paid attention to. Four years later now, um, those issues, in my opinion, still haven't been addressed. And that was the primary uh, reason that I jumped into this campaign um, as opposition. The, the main reason was because I saw the abuses at TriMet and I know that TriMet's getting a lot of funding and we're not getting a lot of service from that. And Metro has in their charter uh, a small piece of legislation that was set up there that we have the ability with a vote on the council to go in and try to restructure TriMet and hold them more accountable. Um, since looking into that, I've actually looked farther into what Metro does and some of the other issues that are important to me. Um, the current state of affairs at Metro as far as development, in my opinion, seems to be going around trying to find uh, a knight in shining armor to come in with a big corporation and set up shop here in Oregon and sort of save our economy. It's my opinion that our economy is best served by raising up local entrepreneurs and serving the small business organizations and, and the small business community that we have already that's very vibrant. So I would like to uh, put more effort into helping the small business community, developing new small businesses, and really getting a backbone of, of our economy that's always been there, which is the small business community and, and more local entrepreneurs. Uh, there is a lot of things coming up with Metro. And it's frustrating that Metro, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again, it's, it's the biggest government that... I'm sure most of you know about, but almost nobody knows about. There's been quite a few of these forums that we've gone to, and you can just ask the crowd who knows what Metro is, who knows what Metro does, and you're lucky if half the people in the room will raise their hand. And as Metro president, that's one of the things I want to bring accountability to Metro in that people know exactly what Metro is, exactly what Metro does, and feel like they're involved and have a voice in Metro's decisions and planning. And I don't feel like people feel that way about Metro right now. They feel uh, a, a lot of what we feel about most government, that they have these great decisions they come up with in a back room somewhere, and then they uh, pass it without any input and try to sell it to us later. And that's not the way I do business. I'm proactive, not reactive. I go in and I would involve every member of the community on every decision. And some, some people, 
may not have constructive criticism or good input, but unless you really hear everybody's perspective, you can't say that it's going to be a good idea for everybody and that you can sell it to them because you need that input in, in the forehand. Um, hasn't happened so much in Washington County of late, but I'm sure you've all heard of the debacle with the Trader Joe's planning in Portland. And what happened is they, they made a deal behind closed doors and then they went in and said, well, this deal has been made and no one in the community really felt like it was appropriate for that community. It actually was pretty pretty good deal, but when you go in and you tell people what you're gonna do instead of asking them what they want, that's when people have a problem. And rightly so, because we live in a democracy. We live in a, in a place where people should feel involved People should feel like they have a voice and a say in what's being planned and what's being uh, orchestrated in their communities from the beginning, not here's the decision, how can we sell it to you, but here's the decision we came to mutually, now let's work on putting it together. Uh, other big things that are going on with Metro, um, they control all of the uh, recycling and garbage for the region and Right now we're recycling more than ever. Thank you very much for recycling. We're, we're, we're a great part of the nation. We really believe in, in helping our environment in that way. Uh, unfortunately, when you run the, the processing centers and the dumps that the garbage goes to, when you get less garbage, you get less money. So there's a lot of funding that decisions that are gonna be coming up in the next few years on how to replace that revenue while at the same time continuing to encourage you to do the right thing in recycling and, and, and helping keep our community the beautiful place that it is. Uh, there are other situations like with the green spaces. In 2009, we passed a bond measure to purchase a bunch of green spaces that still have not had a good solid plan set forward in taking care of them, identifying them for their use and funding them adequately. And the biggest tragedy is if these green spaces continue to be ignored and set off as sort of a, a non-issue until other bigger decisions are made or other issues are taken care of, they're going to become a liability. And the worst part would be for these green spaces to be purchased with our tax bonds only to be sold off later on because we couldn't take care of them. So there's a lot of big issues going on. Um, and I would like to get your input on them and include you in them so that we can really build a, an awesome metropolitan region together and respectfully for the people who live here and the businesses that are here already. Thank you very much. Okay. Drop the mic because I'm a little bit shorter, and uh, I think uh, the metronome Tom Hughes is even shorter. If I may, you, thank you for that that laugh because I think that's a great nickname. As I buy a. Uh, um uh, Tom, a little bit of time to get up here. I'd like to let everyone know he's been stalking me for the last 30 years. A person we mutually know, he calls a goofball, is Mr. James Barlow, who was a wonderful teacher of mine at Aloha High School. And that's how I be first became aware of uh, Tom Hughes, because he was also, at that time, uh, investigating a run for uh, Hillsborough City Council, which turned out to be a good move for Mr. Tom Hughes, who I'd ask that you give a warm round of applause to, Mr. Hughes. Thank you, Eric. I, uh, I always enjoy coming to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum because uh, I've known so many of you so long. We've all kind of aged in place together. Uh, and uh, you're all looking pretty good, I gotta say. It's, uh, wish that was. Uh, but uh, it also because uh, it's always nice to reunite with a couple of former students, Anthony and Eric, and, and um, to get together with some folks that I've worked with for a long time. Uh, I'm in the process now of running for re-election to Metro President. I was elected Metro President Four years ago in 2010, uh, after uh, serving for eight years as Hillsborough mayor uh, and preceding that by, with about uh, 30 years or 25 years as uh, in, in various uh, responsibilities with the city of Hillsborough. So, um, I, but I know I'm, I, I'm very comfortable here at uh, the Pepper Mill because uh, this used to be a favorite watering hole meeting place. For, uh, uh, for department meetings when we wanted to go off-site because 
course, for 30 years, I taught down the street at Aloha High School. So uh, and it wasn't, wasn't very hard to find, find my way here this morning. So why am I running for re-election? Why did I run in the first place? Uh, and where do I think we're going to go over the next four years at Metro? Uh, let me talk just a little bit about uh, the issues that I believed we needed to work on when I ran four years ago. I believe that Metro does certain things, and they do those things really well, uh, that have uh, play an integral part in our ability to organize an economic development strategy for the region. At that point in time, we had no, uh, we had no uh, economic development, regional economic development organization. We had one that was a private sector, Greenlight Greater Portland, and one that was a public sector, the regional partners. Uh, one of the things that I helped to do in the first couple of years that I was, that I was uh, Metro president was to work with the other publics and the private sector to put the, those organizations together in a new group that is now called Greater Portland Inc. And that, that organization has been working very, very hard to organize the region into a regional economic development strategy. Brookings Institute and other uh, specialists around the, the area have, have indicated that the, the new competitive unit worldwide for world trade is not going to be cities to cities or states to states or countries to countries, but regions to regions. And so the Portland metropolitan region is well suited to compete on a global market because we have collectively, we have a lot of assets that we don't have individually. Even a city like Hillsborough that has been relatively successful uh, doesn't have all of the assets it needs to compete successfully on a world world economy, but the Portland metropolitan region does. So Metro has some key things that it can do that helps build that strategy. For example, we can uh, we have looked at uh, location of sites around the region, uh, particularly large lot sites. That's sites over 25 acres. Uh, where are there sites within the urban growth boundary, and uh, and what is keeping those sites from developing. So we've had, we now have a, a, an inventory of lands that are available for, for manufacturing development in particular. We've also worked, of course, Metro has always worked very hard on a, pro, on a strategy to develop within uh, urban centers uh, and corridors. And so the, what is called the, the Metro 2040 plan uh, as an opportunity for us to help local jurisdictions pool together to find out what can be done to encourage development in urban centers. And I know that we've been working, uh, we, we've been talking about how to work with Aloha, for example, to uh, redo, to re-establish uh, uh, downtown, a downtown Aloha and put some life into that to make sure that the economic growth out in this area uh, meets with uh, the kind of growth that we've seen in other places. So those projects, uh, we've made progress on those. Those will continue for the next four years and probably beyond that. It's an ongoing process. Uh, but in the last couple years, I think I've accomplished some things that I'm very proud of. One of those things uh, is that in May of last year, uh, the Metro Council and, uh, and other environmental leaders around the, uh, around the, the region uh, were able to pass a, a bond levy, or a, a, a serial levy, I should say, uh, to finance uh, the, the uh, maintenance and restoration of, of the green spaces that we purchased with the bond that we passed in 2006 in order to buy open space land. We now have 16,000 acres of open spaces around the region. Some of that has already been developed into regional parks like Cooper Mountain, for example, which some of you may be familiar with in this area. Uh, Graham Oaks down in Wilsonville uh, and uh, the one over in the uh, uh, in uh, Clackamas County area that I always forget, but because I've never been there, uh, it's a big region. Uh, so uh, I, I, I've been told by our uh, by our uh, environmentalist friends that it's the first time that a maintenance levy has been passed anywhere in the United States. So it was a it was a pretty pretty big accomplishment that I was able to lead, and uh, we now have a, a five year period in which we can talk to our local partners and find out if there is a way that collaboratively we can work on getting uh, permanent, uh, permanent funding for that. <coughs> Over the next four years, we're going to have to look at the, the waste management system that we have in this region, and we're going to have to figure out a way 
that if we go forward, all of our contracts with our haulers and our land, landfill operators expire in 2019. So between now and 2019, we're going to have to uh, work on how to um, how to redo those contracts in a way that that sets the 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 pattern going forward for how we're going to collect waste in this region over the next uh, 50 years after that. So um, those are are ongoing issues. Uh, we also, I think, need to continue to build on the idea, which is an idea that I've I've emphasized as long as I've been metro president. Uh, and that is, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, while I was traveling, I picked up a little bug. Um, but uh, I have worked really hard over the last four years uh, with our local government partners on the idea that working together, we can accomplish more than any of us can, can accomplish individually. Some people uh, actually don't believe that. I'm surprised to find out. Uh, but, uh, but we've been working on it, and I think that th that our ability to get the local governments uh, to work together has shown itself uh, manifest in a, a project we're working on called uh, Climate Smart Communities, where instead of just saying we need to reduce uh, carbon emissions from trucks and, and, and cars over the next uh, 20 years, here's the regulations we want to put in effect. We went to the local governments and said, what do you want to do? And we pulled all that together and now we have a plan. So. <coughs> Working on those kinds of projects over the next four years, I hope to get us in a position where when I leave office four years from now, uh, we will think of ourselves more as a region than as uh, a confederation of small communities. And with that, I want to thank you for inviting me uh, and thank you for your ongoing support. Bye. Folks, we're going to move over to Q&A here in just a moment, and I'd ask that you keep your questions brief, and candidates, if you could both come up, we'll have you respond to the remarks, and uh, uh, maybe keep uh, responses to a minute or so. And if you're uh, asking a question, please uh, stand in front of the mic, because for, for the camera, we have the laurels of the banner <laughs> that outline your head and make right. you look very smart. And so if you get off mic, you won't look as smart. So help us with that, would you please? Uh, so John McWilliams, would you uh, state your first question? So I am John McWilliams, a foreign member. And so yes, uh, I really appreciate both of you being here and talking about your main interests, especially I think I, I heard a lot about, a lot about the environment. But I, also I believe that the convention center also one of Metro's charges, and I understand that there's a possibility of a big drive to do something about a place to house the convention when it's coming into town in the form of a big hotel. Uh, could you speak on that issue and, and a little bit about what might be going on with it? Appreciate that if you could. Um, well, there's right now in the works uh, plans for a headquarters hotel, also being called in the media the convention center hotel. It's approximately a 600-room hotel. It's going to be a big project. Um, as it currently is written, I am opposed to this particular deal. One, because our local hoteliers association uh, was not put in, in the, the planning process of that. They feel like they were not a part of that deal. Um, in, in particular, Providence Hotels, who runs the Hotel Moderna and a few other hotels in the downtown area. Um, they've complained that most of the hotels in our region actually don't get capacity um, most of the year. And so with another big hotel run by an out-of-state corporation, um, subsidized with our tax dollars, it'll have an unfair advantage and it'll just continue to run a lot of those local hoteliers and their hotels into the ground. Um, we have enough rooms for the conventions. And the argument is you know, people don't want to go across town between their hotel and the convention site. And I've been to quite a few conventions, and I know that's just not true because one of the things you want people to do is to explore your region and your city when they go on a convention. The, that's tourism money. And if we just have them kind of walking back and forth across the street, 
or, or envision that that's what they're going to do or stay within just the Lloyd Center District, then there's a lot of communities, a lot of uh, bar and entertainment districts, a lot of restaurants, a lot of green spaces and other touristy attractions and stuff that we've set up to make our, our place beautiful and presentable that we want people to enjoy they're not going to be able to have that uh, opportunity if we sort of pigeonhole them into one area of the city. Um, in particular, this deal is being made with the Hyatt Hotels, and there's a lot of secret details that I don't like about it, in particular why a multi-billion dollar corporation needs a guaranteed $60 million payout of tax money. Um, that doesn't seem like a fair subsidy uh, for, for a big corporation especially when so many of our local hoteliers were not given the option to be a part of the plan or a part of the planning. Thank you. So as we've assessed the, uh, the operation of the convention center over the years, we believe that it underachieves in terms of attracting conventions and it underachieves primarily in the convention size of about 1,800 to 3,000 uh, attendees. What those uh, conventions require, for the most part, uh, is a hotel that's convenient for the people who plan the convention. And I would, would underline that. Not Obviously, you're not going to put uh, 3,000 3, people. We've got a, a Presbyterian convention coming into town that is going to have about 5,000 people. They all wouldn't fit in a 600-bed hotel. Uh, because Partly because they're Presbyterians, but partly because uh, it just doesn't work out that way. So, uh, so these conventions will spread people around around the area. The downtown, the the hotels in generally in Portland are doing better right now than they've done in in years and years. The uh, occupancy rates are high. Uh, the room rate is going up, and uh, it's an it's a good opportunity. There is uh, there there will be 600 beds built in the region that will cannibalize uh, the the those occupancy rates. We have the only project in town that actually would bring people to town to help fill those, fill those uh, beds, as well as the beds in that hotel. The, the interesting thing about this is, and, uh, and I've heard from the folks at, at Provenance that this has been a secret deal, and boy, if they didn't know, they might have participated too. Well, it was done by an open competitive bidding process. We did a, an RFP that was out on the street for about uh, six months. We told them at the time that part of the part of our part of the deal was that we would rebate the the uh, the tax from the hotel uh, to the owner or to the successful bidder as part of the deal. Uh, that amounts to about sixty million dollars. We figured out a different way to do it that amounts to about sixty million dollars. Same source. This is going to be paid for by the people staying in this hotel. We actually put one of the one of the principles of Providence on the committee that selected the RFP, that reviewed the RFP. So it always strikes me as a little amusing when they say they didn't get any word about this. They were involved in it from the beginning and, and they, it's been an open uh, process. It's good for the region, it's good, it's good for uh, the convention business, but it also is good for the restaurant business, the retail business, uh, and it has enjoyed widespread support from the travel industry as well as the retail industry uh, all over the Portland metropolitan area. In fact, uh, Mayor Willie from Hillsborough came in and testified in favor of it when it was before uh, the when it was before the Portland uh, Portland City Council because he believes that it benefits uh, businesses in Washington County as people from those conventions come out tour wineries and, and spend money in Washington County. So I think it's going to be a good project, and I think quite frankly. We've been talking about it for 30 years, and we're just uh, on the verge of being successful with it. So we're going to go forward. I'm Bill Kroger, forum member. Thank you. Is this on? Yep. I'm Bill Kroger, forum member. Thank you both for coming in. Um, this question is primarily for Mr. Hughes, but Mr. Johnson, if you want to comment, that certainly is fine, too. I'm a big fan of the state's uh, land use laws, you know, the system of urban growth boundaries. and uh, But yet there was a lot of criticism recently about a situation that went on out Schultz Ferry Road out by Roy Rogers and the whole land situation that ended, ended up having to be bailed out by the legislature. I was just curious if maybe, I'm still really confused about some of that and I was wondering if maybe you could talk about that and shed some light on it for me. Are you talking about the so-called grand bargain? Yeah. Because I, because 
I, we were actually focused, most, most of the discussion was focused more on the property north of Hillsboro and not so much on Schultz Ferry Road area. But um, we have just uh, successfully now, thanks to the legislature, completed a process of identifying a 50-year land supply for the region. Uh, for 50 years, we now know where we're going to expand, when and if we have to expand the urban growth boundary. That's something that no other, no other region in the, in the United States has ever attempted to do, and this is with the Rural Reserve Urban Reserve process. In doing that, we have now preserved about 23,000 acres of land that we, are, uh, that we are going to eventually, over the next 50 years, bring into the urban growth boundary, and we've preserved 270,000 acres of farmland under the Rural Reserve process. So that's land that will not even be considered for urban growth boundary expansion for the next 270 years. Uh, hold it. 50 years, 270,000 acres. I get my numbers right yet. Uh, I, I was a history major, so I don't do math. Uh, the, um, the, the problem was that Washington County, in going through their process, uh, took a, a, a kind of a side trip. They, they sort of said, we've got, we've got factors that we want to consider, and we've done this study, and we think this study is better than state law, so we're going to apply the factors instead of state law. And the courts, interestingly enough, said, you know, you can apply whatever factors you want, but you got to apply state law. So you got to redo all of your all of your rural reserves. That would have bogged us down in a land use thing that would have taken three to five years to get through, and then another two to three years to get litigated. And so uh, we went to the legislature. There was some folks who had already gone to the legislature, and there was a bill in place that allowed us to say. Okay, here's what's here's what's going to happen as of right now. So they fixed the urban growth boundary as it was when it pat when it, when we passed it at the end of 2011, and they fixed the rural reserves. It it included a discussion amongst all the people who had been involved in the lawsuit. So it was essentially a settlement of a lawsuit, and therefore we didn't come back and do public hearings. We didn't do a lot of other things. Those had already been held. This was now amongst the people who had objected to the original version and those who thought the original version was good. So we had a, a settlement agreement that the legislature put into effect, and that now becomes the urban growth boundary and the uh, urban reserves. And we lost about uh, 2,000 acres of urban reserves and uh, added those back into rural reserves, but we brought about 700 acres of urban reserves into the urban growth boundary and then identified South Hillsboro, South Cooper Mountain, and North Hillsboro expansions of the urban growth boundary as in place. So the process can now go forward. It's important to us because we're starting the process to look at what the urban growth boundary decision is going to be for 2015. We have to finish this year with an urban growth report, which means we need to know how much land is in the urban growth boundary now in order to go forward. We now know that and we can proceed uh, a pace and uh, when we'll have our urban growth report ready in 2015. I don't have a whole lot to say about it. Um, I think the, the grand bargain was a good plan. Um, ultimately, I would look at what sort of oversight didn't happen that got the decision referred to the court the first time. Because um, my understanding is that they sort of handed off each county in each region it's its own sort of to-do list and then they all came back with the information and compiled it together threw together a plan and then found out that um, certain people who had been in part of the planning process had done it inaccurately or had not taken into certain uh, certain factors into consideration and that's why it was referred to the courts in the first place um, so I think getting uh, a look at that oversight on how those uh, how that plan was put into place in the first place so that it got referred to the courts so that that doesn't happen again because you know whenever anything goes to the courts I think it was a, do a bullet dodged in that it didn't tie it up for for years possibly decades because we know in Oregon when things hit the courts that that's exactly what happens sometimes so I'd like to have some sort of assurance that that sort of referral to the courts on decisions like this wouldn't happen in the future. Hi, I'm Marilyn McWilliams, um, them, forum member and Fulton Valley Water District Commissioner. And I have a question, um, really kind of a comment or a challenge to both of you. 
Um, I appreciate the fact that Metro has been very instrumental in encouraging business and, and economic growth in, in the Metro area. But um, I am wanting to kind of put forward the idea that, that with the, um, the Phil Knight challenge that we have an opportunity to bring like a billion dollars into the state through medical research in this area. And I'd like to hear each of you talk about your vision of how Metro could support this, because this is a big shot in the arm for Portland. Um, I was kind of frustrated by the proposition by uh, Phil Knight because it seemed kind of like a, a, a rich man's game where he was saying, well, I'll, I'll match your 500 million if, if you get your 500 million first. Um, and a lot of people in, in, in more impoverished areas around the, the, the region kind of felt that way, like why does it have to be sort of a, a challenge or a dare that the richest guy in the state can kind of play a game with his money when you know, cancer is a very real thing that we're all gonna deal with for a long time. It's probably one of the major issues that we're gonna deal with as we continue to improve our medical understanding of other conditions and, and heal other diseases. Cancer is one of those things, this, it, new cancers are developing, and it's one of those things that we're just gonna have to pay a lot of attention, a lot of money on. Um, ultimately, I would like to see a billion dollars in, in, in medical research development happen in the region. Uh, as a population, we are aging. Um, we, uh, the United States is in a unique position that we aren't on the population to decline that a lot of first world nations are because of our immigration policies. Um, and that's a, another uh, conversation entirely, but um, we're not gonna have the, the population declines, but at the same time, we're still overall an aging population. And so we need to be able to take care of our elders, keep them in their homes, um, keep them a part of the community. Uh, I spoke at Elders in Action on Saturday and one of their uh, questions was, um, what do you see as the value of elders in our community? And, and it, my only response could be is, you know, why do we need a, a senior community center instead of just a community center? Why are seniors seen as like a separate community outside of the rest of the community? Because um, it didn't used to be that way. I remember when I was a boy, uh, the community center was grandma's house and grandpa, you know, he was the coach for the little league team and we all went to have a barbecue in the backyard and I would like to get back to that part of our culture where we're not separate communities within a greater community, but we're just one great community. Um, and I think helping the vision for finding that billion dollars in medical research will just help us in a lot of great ways. Um, hopefully not all just towards cancer research, but we have a mental health crisis in Oregon right now that we need to take care of. Uh, there's a lot of other disabilities. Autism is skyrocketing. There's a lot of things that we need to take care of in the medical field. And I've always been very proud of OHSU in a lot of ways in how they've taken care of children at Dornbecker's. Um, their medical research is on the cutting edge for the world. And I'd like to keep that. I'd like to maintain that. Um, it, yeah, it's, it, it's going to have to take some unpacking, some looking into. Um, but overall, it's, it's a great thing if we can really nail it down. Um, so far, I haven't heard whether or not OHSU has reached their, their donation mark. I imagine it won't be impossible for them. They have a lot of big donors, other than Phil Knight, who believe in their cause and their purpose. So um, we'll look forward to hopefully meeting, meeting that goal and, and talking more about the development of that in the future. Thank you. Marilyn, you've identified the, the Phil Knight's generous offer at partly for what it is. I mean, it's also, it's a humanitarian uh, opportunity. It's an opportunity to invest uh, a lot of money in an institution that has gone a long ways towards helping us find cures for cancer. Uh, but it also is a job creator. I mean, the, that billion dollars at OHSU could create up to 6,000 jobs uh, in what already is the, the state's second largest uh, employer. And, um, and I think that, th that that's a key, a, a key thing. As to what Metro can do, I think that what, what Knight is attempting to do is to challenge uh, the private sector folks, the businesses in the community, to step forward and match his charitable contributions. Um, Met Metro doesn't have a, re a revenue source, uh, nor do very many 
uh, state agencies in the state. The state is actually, the legislature, I think, appropriated some money that would count towards, um, towards the contribution. But uh, we, we don't have a, a source that would be readily available to do that, unfortunately. But uh, I would, you know, would use the good offices that I have with a lot of business leaders in the community to urge them to put this higher on their priority for charitable giving because I think that it's, uh, it is an interesting opportunity to A, create jobs, and B, to create jobs through a private investment as opposed to a government subsidy. And I think that that's a, a, a key element to doing this also. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> Harry Bodine, Forum member. Gentlemen, last Friday I was at Lenco High School all day long with, with a group of veterans uh, talking to students. And uh, a number of them were from North Plains. I said, I said, one time I asked a question. I said, what do you think of recology? We hate it. This is the, uh, the re re composting recycling uh, center out there just off of Highway 26. Uh, my question would be, if recycling is good and composting is good, why did we stick it North Plains with it? Why didn't we put it in Portland or someplace where all the people who are so enthusiastic about it could live with it? Um, that's a great question. That's something I actually support. Instead of just one giant compost heap out in North Plains, we should have several small ones that are regional. Uh, one, it would be cheaper to get the compost there. Um, there could even be on-site composting options where we were picking up finished compost instead of compost scraps and finishing them off ourselves. And compost is one of those things that if we get a grasp on it, it actually could be a good revenue source because once we turn it into compost, Metro then sells it back to the community um, at a very low cost to help them plant their own gardens and, and, and lawns and whatever else they can. So um, that is a, a great issue that I look forward to, to taking on because uh, we do need the composting. Um, that's one of our biggest garbage sources is, is food waste, biological garbage uh, like food waste. So we need to have a good set plan and one of the things I would like to do is to have it more regional. Uh, smaller regional processing centers so that we have less travel time, less need for trucks going for long distances, so saving on fuel and less of a carbon footprint on that end, and, you know, less stink. So <laughs> I, I felt sorry for the people in North Plains. I have uh, family on North Plains, and so that was, that was hard when they were saying, hey, you know, this great thing, I'm glad you guys have compost. We're the ones who have to smell it, and <laughs> North Plains isn't even in the, the U, UGB technically, so um, it was kind of a, a backyard treatment of a, of, a, of a neighbor that I didn't, I didn't really like uh, on a political level. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to tackling that issue. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that North Plains got the short end of a bad decision, and the bad decision started with the city of Portland's insistence on moving forward with a, a food waste re, uh, program, a pickup program that uh, had a lot of criticism at the local level in terms of how frequently it was going to be picked up and when it was going to get picked up. One of the things that they discovered that it w if you pick up food scraps, uh, once a week, but you only pick up regular garbage once every other week, then people tend to throw the dirty diapers and other things in with the food scraps, which means that about every fourth or fifth uh, load of food scraps is, is contaminated. So uh, it's not a very efficient way to do it, but it, it, what, it happened, what it did to Recology was it overwhelmed their system. And so uh, they've, made some, we've, they've made some adjustments with Washington County for their permit. Uh, they are no longer accepting, uh, I don't, I, I can't, they're, they're either not accepting commercial food waste, there's a, one category of food waste that they're no longer accepting. The interesting thing about it is we have lots of capacity in, in the various recycling places around the region, and um, so we were able to shift that uh, to other places uh, that uh, had, were we're geared up and ready to accept that, that volume of material. So uh, the, the program goes forward, and um, you know I think that what we're gonna find is that as we work the kinks out of it, uh, we will find more communities who wanna do that too. The problem is we probably are never gonna go back to North Plains again because 
you, it'll be 20 years before that thing stops smelling bad, before people will stop smelling it and thinking it smells bad. So uh, that's, a, that's a bad PR, B, PR thing more than anything else, I think, right now. Hi, I'm Emily Knapp. I'm a member. Um, we've talked about the regional economy several times, and Metro isn't directly involved. But could you reflect on the impact of the problems with the Longshoremen and the Port of Portland and our main regional economy regarding the port? And is there a role for Metro to help mediate or help with that situation? Uh, you, you remind me a little bit of a conversation Harry and I were having before we started this where uh, you were remembering back in the good old days when uh, everybody who had a problem gave it to Metro, uh, you know, whether it was uh, disposing solid waste materials or running the zoo or, uh, or, or uh, uh, how do we, what do we do with the 14 uh, cemeteries that uh, we have scattered around the areas? I, I don't know that Metro has a direct role in, in uh, facilitating that. I think it has, it, it has had a hugely negative impact on the region. Uh, with Hanjin uh, pulling out, for example, that we lose one of our major uh, carriers to the east, and uh, you know, at a time when Portland is uh, is in the process of trying to make ourselves uh, to to move from the second uh, fastest growing export market in the United States to being the first, uh, it's hard to do that if you don't have shippers hauling your stuff uh, to where it needs to go. So. Um, I thought that was, I never completely understood the issues. Uh, it was largely a jurisdictional dispute between the longshoremen and the, and the uh, electrical workers. Uh, I, I only heard about it primarily since I, I don't have a lot of immediate contact with, with longshoremen. I heard most of it from the electrical workers, and so uh, it, it probably made less sense to me than it did to a longshoreman. But, uh, but I don't, I don't know that there was a role for Metro to do other than to sort of join in the collective clicking of teeth and saying, gee, that's a really awful thing to have happen. Uh, my understanding of the complaints from the longshoremen was mostly a wage issue. Their wages, like so many in the region, haven't really gone up um, in proportion to the productivity and the overall economy. Um, one, uh, it, it really wouldn't be uh, an issue that Metro would have too much say in because it, it is mostly Port of Portland would, would have the, the big control over that. They're, they're another big government that hardly anybody knows anything about and unfortunately has less accountability as they're not, uh, they don't have a lot of elected positions or, or I don't believe any elected positions in Metro or in Port of Portland. Yeah, yeah. They're all appointed. So um, seeing more accountability um, directly to the public of Port of Portland would probably uh, resolve issues like that uh, more directly. Um, it is frustrating, though, because we are a shipping hub, and all of our region's businesses depend on that main lifeblood. Um, so making sure that the longshoremen are happy so that they can do their job is, is going to be a priority for us all. Um, and I know sometimes union demands seem outrageous, um, kind of like kids on Christmas Day when you give, tell them, go ahead and write your letter to Santa. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're providing livable wages, that you know people aren't paying 80% of their income on rent and then have nothing left over at the end of the month to pay for the rest of their bills, which are also going up. So thank you. Patrick Wheeler, farm member. I'd be curious on your thoughts on a west side bypass. I've always thought the west side bypass has gotten to be one of those projects that you can't mention the name without everybody in the room having a feeling about it. So we'd be better off to call it some something else. I thought for a while we might try the Neil Goldschmidt freeway, but uh, <laughs> somehow that may may have been a little bit worse. I'm not sure. Uh, I, what I think we need to do is we need to look at, at the west side transportation needs, uh, particularly as they pertain to the, to, uh, the most productive uh, uh, manufacturing center anywhere in the state of Oregon, which is the North Hillsboro, North 
Beaverton area and asked the question, how do we get, how do we get products into, freight out of, and employees to those places where they, they're going to work uh, in a way that leaves the rest of us somewhat free to, you know, free to move about the cabin. Uh, and uh, I, I think when you ask those questions, you kind of get, get over the idea of a West Side Bypass. West Side Bypass may or may not be the solution. What we need to do maybe is look at uh, Cornelius Pass. What are we gonna, how can we make Cornelius Pass a more uh, effective uh, route to take products from Hillsboro, for example, over to the airport, or from Hillsboro up to I-5 heading north, uh, heading north to, uh, uh, to, to Seattle? Uh, and how, what, other, what other changes need to be made uh, to 26 in order to make it an effective? What do we need to do to 217 uh, in order to do those things? But if we look at it uh, in terms of outcomes, what are the outcomes that we want to see from our investments? Uh, then I think we would make different investments than if we hang ourselves up on being either for or against a particular uh, project. Uh, this is a big reason why TriMet has been so much a, a focus of my energy, and that's because if TriMet continues to make cuts, and particularly cuts to service on the west side and on the east side east of Portland, um, focusing all their main services towards like the Portland metro, uh, the Portland urban area, central urban area, um, people are going to have to drive because they don't have the option of, of public transportation. And so as TriMet continues to mismanage their budgets, uh, more people are left hanging without a, a bus or, or any other form of transportation to get them where they're going, they're going to drive. And the more people are driving, the more cars on the road, the, the more horrible all the traffic throughout the region gets, um, especially on the west side. And it's never really been adequately addressed on the west side. The traffic over here has been horrible for decades. Um, and I think one of the things that we haven't really looked at is a major metropolitan area that had been already done in some other metropolitan areas around the United States is uh, trying to coordinate when those shipments are coming and going. Um, I know it used to be in Seattle and I believe in certain parts of LA that the trucks couldn't enter the major parts of the cities and uh, the major metropolitan region until certain times of day when the commuter traffic had tailed off. Um, so that would mean shipments uh, would have to come in before 6 a.m. or after 10 a.m., something like that, so that the trucks and the cars aren't on the roads at the same time optimally, at least not in big numbers. Uh, so that's one thing that we should look at is, is better planning on how we're using our, our roads and our transportation, giving people the option who, who may not want to drive but feel it's necessary by improving our, our, our metropolitan's uh, transportation system. Uh, is, is a major thing that we have to really look at because right now, as it stands, um, I mean, if you read the Oregonian, I mean, not, not that we should always take the Oregonians uh, a word at, at its gospel, but uh, TriMet is close to going under, quite frankly, um, and the positions of their executives there are to really not deal with that at all and instead kind of take payouts uh, and give themselves bonuses and pats on the back of what a great job they're not doing. Um, so, you know, getting more access to public transportation, coordinating our transportation needs around different times of day and how our city works, or, or how our metropolitan region works, our different cities. There's 25 cities in the metro area, and we all have different schedules, different communities, different populations that, that need to be addressed differently. Um, it's an interesting question, definitely, and it's, it's one that's going to take some unpacking because a lot of our development up to date has not taken that into account. Um, a lot of our road building. I know it's frustrating catching a bus on the west side because there are not a lot of north-south routes. Um, so that's one thing that I would like to, to help fix is get more crosstown routes. Uh, everything's funneled to kind of go east to west from Gresham to Forest Grove through downtown and we need to look at more alternative routes without big, long, three-year-long construction projects. Uh, they just recently did work on Cornelius Pass, and it, it hindered a lot of us in being able to get where we're going on time for a long time. So figuring out how to do road construction more efficiently and 
more quickly um, so that when we see a road needs to be widened or a new route needs to be put in, that it, it, it happens in a time that by the time we're done building it, we don't already have a new problem, but we've actually solved a problem instead of created 10 new ones. So, thank you. Chris Leslie, board member. I wanted to ask about uh, your thinking on the CRC, Columbia River Crossing, and how that wasted a lot of money by the old expression, death by committee. There's just all that uh, waste. And you have other projects you want to do today that are being wasted. What would you stop? I'll go first on this one. Um, who here can say they didn't like everything about the CRC? I mean, and, uh, like, it's just, it's ridiculous that we've spent enough money to build two bridges um, and still haven't built one. And that's really, it's a question that I don't think people are hammering on uh, our governor hard enough because he sort of spearheaded the whole movement for the CRC and he grabbed a hold of his uh, cronies there and, and that's where a lot of the, his, the, the funding for this has gone. A lot of uh, fees for advice to our governor on how to build it and the plan they, they came up with was that the bridge was too low and like I said we're we're a shipping hub we're Portland's a port city and if your bridge is too low then the ships that we depend on the ships that we build can't come and go so knowing something's a bad plan from the beginning and throwing it out right away would have been great three years ago um, getting some new people in there to give advice on the building of a bridge that really knew what they were doing instead of just taking their fees and, and walking away with them. Uh, there's a lot there that I think is going to be unpacked and, and investigated for a long time to come because $300 million plus is a lot of money to not have a bridge built. Um, unfortunately, something's going to have to be done because the bridge is old. It's not handling the capacity of the traffic that it's taking on right now. And, you know, all my life we've been hearing about the big one, but eventually it will come and I don't want it to happen while I'm alive. But if it does, that bridge is probably going to come down. So it has some structural work that it needs. Um, uh, definitely a new bridge would be the best bet, but at least fixing the old bridge that's there now would be a good bet. And um, figuring out a process so that we can get like I said, you know, construction projects take so long in the planning and the funding and the building. Uh, we need to really step up how we plan and how we uh, fund things so that we can get them in a working order and usable right away to our community. And at the same time, um, you know, I, I would like a full investigation from, from our, our attorney general on why so much money has been spent on a bridge that was never built. That's... That's, that would be a good place to start for me. So, thank you. So the reality is we still need a bridge. And uh, the traffic is still jammed up. The bridge, uh, in addition to n likely falling down in an earthquake, which is a, a, a once in a lifetime experience, uh, it, it does raise and lower about uh, 400 times a year which jams traffic up even worse. And, and it doesn't really take an earthquake to put the bridge out of commission. You remember not uh, a couple months ago, I think it was, the bridge went up in a, in a windstorm and uh, knocked the rollers off and it was frozen in, in an upright position for about six hours. So uh, it's, a, it's a, 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 a transportation problem that needs to be overcome. We've invested, as, uh, the last number I saw, but then uh, I don't always get the numbers right away. It was about $120 million in the planning and, and permitting process. And we've arrived at a certain, at a certain place. Uh, that's been put on hold because the legislatures have both said we don't want to move forward on it. Well, at some point in time, we're going to have to move forward on something. And I think that the strategy now is to preserve what we've got enough so that we don't have to go back and redo all of this again. Uh, bridge was, well, the bridge was low, but that was not a... That was not a very expensive fix. We could mitigate that by simply moving the two, uh, the two users who were above the bridge, 
that that would have had a uh, would have had a problem with it. We could move them below the bridge, uh, and for the two or three times a year that they were going to have to go through the bridge, that would have would have solved their problem. So that was taken care of. It is the question of getting the funding in place in order to do it. So I, I think we still have to keep working on it. I don't I don't think though that I think that they were wise to shut down the committees and the planning process so that we don't spend a lot more money on planning. Folks, we're done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Get better. Before we wrap, I'm just going to uh, alert you folks that uh, next week we've got uh, uh, the invited candidates for U.S. Senate. Uh, that includes uh, William Burke, the infamous Pavel Goberman. Senator Jeff Merkley is unconfirmed. Uh, we do have Tim Crawley, a Republican candidate, confirmed. Monica Webley is unconfirmed. Mark Callahan is confirmed. And Jason Conger is unconfirmed. So we don't know who's going to be here, uh, w with the exception of uh, a few. But uh, Pavel Goverman is always entertaining and one of our highest ranking uh, YouTube views for the forum website. So uh, with that being said, I'd like to ask for your just brief attention for one last thing. Uh, we have a mixed group of people here with different levels of hearing, and I go, as may many of you do, to a lot of public meetings, and this room actually sounds really good, especially for people who have hearing-assisted uh, uh, support issues. And Joseph Tyner and uh, other forum members show up early, and it takes six to ten hours in order to set up the room so we can all be heard, and your questions can be heard and documented. So I ask for a little bit of applause for the fabulous Joseph Tyner. Yay! Come back in a week. We're done. Bye-bye.